As you've heard, today is Trinity Sunday. Protestant reformer and the original Lutheran, Martin Luther, once warned, to deny the Trinity is to risk our salvation, and to try and explain the Trinity is to risk our sanity. So I have good news and bad news today. This, my final Trinity Sunday, I will neither try to uh, risk salvation or explain the Trinity for the risk of my sanity. By doing this, I risk neither my salvation nor my sanity. I, but I do refer you back to 24 other sermons on the Trinity and salvation and sanity, and probably more than 24. Um, today is my final Memorial Sunday with you, and I want to lift up one of the most unique and beautiful parts of our sanctuary. It is the Wall of Honor and the Book of Honor found in the southwest corner of our sanctuary next to the United States flag and right above the kneeler. The wall was put together with glue and cork board beginning in 1941 as our soldiers went to war one by one and left this congregation to serve. It named the 238 men and women, 230 men and eight women, who served in World War II from this congregation. Think about that number. That was 20% of the membership of First Congregational Church. One out of every five members of this church served the United States military during World War II. Thanks be to God. In 2015, Adam Wade beautified the wall. He alphabetized and redid the entire wall, adding a book for anyone to sign, celebrating or remembering those who served or those who are serving or have served our nation in the service branches. Over the past nine years, 257 names have been written in the book, including 26 members. Today, I invite everyone to go to the corner, sign the names of loved ones into that book. Many of you have through the years and add to the book. And I invite you to do so after the service, not during the sermon. <laughs> but I want to recognize, is Adam with us today? Adam, Adam, he's not here. He was going to try to make it. And uh, I, he, uh, please, let's put our hands together anyway for Adam as he did this wonderful work. Now, would you join me in prayer as we turn our hearts and our minds to the wall and the book? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. On the second Sunday of Advent in 1941, a 17-year-old Ohio teen was thinking about one thing in church that day, about a pretty young girl in his congregation. He wasn't even giving much consideration to the coming of the baby Jesus in just a few weeks. He would write about this in his journal that night, noting that she didn't even look at me in church today. He also mentioned in passing in the journal that night that something bad happened today and that President Roosevelt had just spoken on the radio about it to the whole nation. Lots of focus on the young woman, not so much on what the president had to say, but this was December 7, 1941. A date which the president would say that night, and then again, a date that would live in infamy, the date of Pearl Harbor. The young high school senior was my father, Herman Ahrens Jr., and his home was Marion, Ohio. Three years and nine days later, December 16, 1944, a 20-year-old um, Herman Ahrens, along with 500,000 American troops and a total of a million Allied troops in Europe was all, were all fighting for their lives as Hitler's Nazi forces mounted the most massive offensive of the war against our troops in the Ardennes forest. My father was on the front lines of that assault. This bloodiest battle in which the Americans fought in World War II on European soil, the Battle of the Bulge, as it became known, because of the penetrating bulge 
that the Nazis blew through the defense of our forces, took 19,000 soldiers' lives. Another 75,000 soldiers were casualties in this battle that lasted six weeks, and we had 23,000 prisoners of war taken and 749 United States prisoners of war massacred by the Nazis in the Ardennes Forest. One of the lucky ones that survived that massacre was Twink Star, our beloved friend and member who was taken as a prisoner of war. My father's name is in the book, by the wall of honor right next to another one, my beloved friend and first lieutenant in the United States Army, Rupert Twink Star who was captured just a mile away from my father, as it turns out, as they fought in the Ardennes Forest that, that winter. Their names will be forever connected because of Honor in Service book. There are 257 men and women whose names appear in the book, which has been and still does receive names to this moment and should for years to come. Every single service branch is mentioned and honored by their names. 28 have been members of First Church. There are many who received the Purple Heart, including my dad, for wounds received during their service. We have Bronze Star and Silver Star recipients in the book, and we have seven identified Gold Star service members, meaning they died while serving the United States in the military service. They are John Sittler, who is my wife's uncle, Donald Eddie Dempsey Pond, Donald Dempsey Pond Jr., Aaron Floyd Jones, Louis James Bamberger, Douglas A. Bricker, and Douglas Zembiak. The book is filled with names of loved ones, some living and most now deceased, of blessed memory, all of them patriots. Sadly, we have buried everyone whose name is on the wall. No one is left. When I arrived 25 years ago, there were at least 50 or more that I knew of still alive and listed on the wall. They are all gone, just their memories remain. On Friday, following my first reflection, I heard from Jim Woodard about one of the 238 on the wall, his uncle, William F. Woodard. Jim shared this. After reading your article and reflections, I must stop and think of my late uncle, William F. Woodard. Uncle Bill served in World War II in the European theater. His chief responsibility was to be assigned Jeep driver for General George F. Patton. Kind of an important job. <laughs> he drove Patton's Jeep for most of his time in Europe and particularly in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Germany. Uh, Uncle Bill, as I always called him, had many interesting stories to tell about Patton, I can only imagine. He always said that Patton was a great general. In my view, even though Uncle Bill only drove Patton's Jeep, he was still part of those who helped win the war and hopefully preserved our republic for many years to come. So I honor his service to our country. I thank Jim for this, and I can tell you, Uncle Bill definitely served our nation well, because if we had lost General George F. Patton, we would have probably lost the war. Uncle Jim was instrumental in preserving the Republic. Thanks be to God for Bill Woodard and all the patriots on the wall, and for Herman Ahrens and Twink Star and all the women and men in the book. In his book, The Things They Carried, American short story writer and novelist Tim O'Brien tells stories about his platoon of American soldiers fighting on the ground in Vietnam. His third book about the war is based upon his experiences as a soldier in the 23rd Infantry Division. O'Brien generally refrains from political debate and discourse re regarding the war. Instead, he shares the pain of being dismayed that people in his hometown in Minnesota seem to have so little concern or understanding of the war and its world. That is the foundation of his writing and the things they carried. In 1990, he wrote, 43 years old, and the war occurred half a lifetime ago, and yet I remember things now that makes it real now. And sometimes remembering will lead to a story which makes it forever. That's what stories are for. Stories are for joining the past to the future. 
Stories are for those late hours in the night when you can't remember how you got from where you were to where you are. Stories are for eternity. When memory is erased, when there is nothing to remember except the story. Tim O'Brien is right. Remembering them means everything. Each week when we celebrate communion at 9 a.m. and each first Sunday here in the sanctuary at 11, we say the Eucharistic prayers in which Jesus tells us time and time again, remember me, remember me, remember me. It is carved into our table. It should be carved into our memories. We can and must remember them and their stories. Their stories are so much more than the honors pinned on their chests and handed them for actions they took in the conflict of war. Their stories are our forever touchstones to a collective future. The story of, stories of my father in war didn't touch me deeply until I was a grown man and then started asking him all over again about his experiences. When he returned from World War II, my dad packed away his uniform, like so many others, went to college on the GI Bill, met and married my mom, and then became a husband, a dad, an editor, and a grandfather. My father was a pacifist who was gently shamed by his father into conscription because his third-generation German immigrant father felt that as a German, he had to go and face down the Nazis. My dad did not want to carry or fire a rifle, so he did everything in his power not to. That's a story in itself. But the ultimate sign of this commitment was that he was willing to lay down his life for his soldier friends. He was nonviolent in a war when he volunteered to be a runner, and runners didn't carry weapons. Runners ran their mission two by two to take top secret messages that couldn't be sent by radio or Morse code. He would run, often crossing enemy lines or ending up in territory no one knew who was in charge of, to get a message to units in danger. He was wounded by a blast from a German panzer tank on one such mission and pulled from the ground in the field to safety in a farmhouse by French farmers. And I, I choked up at the first service when I thought about this. He always used to tell me that we have to regard the French with the highest esteem. And I never understood why until he told me that they hid him from the Nazis and saved his life. One day, my second oldest child, Danny, was interviewing his grandpa and talking about the runners. Standing apart from the conversation, drinking my coffee, having heard these stories in the past, and never having asked, I piped in, Dad, how many runners were there in your unit? He looked up and he answered, there were six. I followed up, and how many of them survived your mission during the war? And he raised his index finger, smiled ever so slightly and shyly and almost regretfully said, one. He was the solitary survivor. Through the years, he had shared their stories name by name, person by person with me, and I really hadn't paid attention. We had visited the grave of his best friend in the unit, Brownie, who was a first-generation German immigrant and, in fact, ran into trouble because he spoke German fluently and sometimes it was hard to understand his English. So he got shot at a lot by his own troops because he would yell that he was back and it wasn't safe to yell it in a German accent. Brownie was buried in Toledo, Ohio. All of them had died beside him. He was the only keeper of their stories. That is why he told so many war stories. They weren't stories of big things. They were stories of five men. These stories were not about human conquest and violence. They were all about the men who carried no weapons, but instead carried vital messages on foot through fields and villages in Belgium, France, Holland, and Germany. Whatever their stories are, we must hear them and tell them. I'm reminded of something else Tim O'Brien wrote, something simple and profound. He wrote in the same book that he remembers his first encounter with a dead body, that of his childhood sweetheart, Linda. Suffering from a brain tumor, Linda died at the age of nine, and he was deeply affected by her funeral. He says that in Vietnam, the soldiers would tell stories to one another 
of those who they had loved and lost back home, as though to tell that story would keep death away from them. He keeps Linda alive by telling her story. Do you see how that works? It is not just the stories of soldiers this Memorial Day we must tell. It is the stories of lost friends and classmates which shape our lives and our future. It is the stories of siblings who have died. It is the stories of parents and others. For me, that includes Sammy Bloom and Sal Lanciano, two friends I lost in childhood. Upon reading O'Brien's story of Linda on Friday morning, Ruth Decker reached out and she said to me, I have a story to tell. It is the story of her classmate, Freddie. She wrote, your first reflection this morning moved me to tell about one of the memories that I carry. I may be the only one now who remembers Freddie Stillerman. Freddie was a skinny Jewish boy in my first and second grade classes. One day he was not in class. This went on for several weeks. My mother said that Freddie was sick. Finally, our teacher told us that Freddie would be coming back to school, but that he would look different. Indeed, he looked different. He looked fat. Our teacher had warned us and everyone was kind and did not ridicule him. Finally, my mother told me that Freddie had leukemia and that he would not live very long. The treatment had made him look bad. I pondered this for several days and I began to worry that Freddie would not go to heaven because he didn't believe in Jesus. My limited Lutheran knowledge was believe in Jesus and you go to heaven. Actually, that's right, <laughs> right? And for others, too bad. I finally mentioned my concern to my mother. She was washing dishes, listen very carefully, and I was on the kitchen floor playing on the blackboard hung from the side of the counter. She paused and looked, and, without, and then without turning around, she simply said, I think God understands. I think God understands. And Jack, I think that could be said the other way. I think God understands as Jews lift up the memory of their beloved, that they understand that God accepts us too into the heavenly realm. These are words I've carried for 80 years, Ruth says. I think of Freddie often. His memory is alive with me, but I need to pass it on. And now it's ours. Thank you, my friend. I would add, I think God more than understands. God more than received Freddie in his loving arms long ago and has held him eternally. Now we hold him too in all of our hearts, thanks to you. Together we will keep his memory alive. For the 238 souls whose names are memorialized on the wall of honor, for the 257 whose names are memorialized in the book of honor, and for the names that you will add today, we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God for all the brave men and women fighting for freedom today around the globe. We give thanks to God for the tens of thousands of lives of the innocent lost in war, caught in the crossfire between combatants. We give thanks to God for the survivors of war who live to tell their stories, for the soldiers who come home to tell the stories of the others. And we give thanks to God for the freedom gained when soldiers and others through the ages have laid down their lives again and again to gain, to preserve, and to protect us. We give thanks to God for all we remember through our lifetime who have inspired us and guided us to be better people by their examples and their lives like Freddie. So today, let us remember. Let us always remember. Amen.